It is a new year, and I promised you guys we would start with fireworks. This week, we have none other than 16-time Bassmaster winner, record 32-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, four-time Bassmaster Classic champion, just about to kick off his 50th season of competition. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the legendary Mr. Rick Clun joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I welcome you into the 142nd edition of this particular show and the very first show in 2024 i hope you all had a great festive season and happy new year to all of you i hope your years are off to a great start i missed you guys last week last week the week between christmas and new year's is the only week i take off all year i mean we get we get to hang out every single wednesday all year but that's the week that i take off and uh hung out with my family had a great time and um it always passes way too quick, but 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 believe it or not, I did miss all of you. So I, I'm happy to have you back in my life. This uh, this show is more than a show to me. Um, the interactions that we get to have in the comments and and just getting to know you guys and getting to have the conversations with the people that I do is something I truly cherish. So uh, I believe it or not, I missed you guys last week, but uh, I'll be back in your life until well, the week after Christmas. Um, next year or in 20 this year 20 now that's the other thing that bothers me for the next well three to four months i will write the date wrong on anything that i actually write on anymore when you think about it you don't actually write a lot of dates anymore your phone fills out half the crap for you um so i hope you're off to a great start i hope your season your 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 new season new your new year on life is off to a great start um, I hope your resolutions are going well. If you keep resolutions, and speaking of which, let's let's throw it out there. Question of the week. I mean, I always forget to do these, but question of the week this week, and this is I want you guys all to participate in this. Let me know in the comments. You do have resolutions or you don't, and if you're willing, tell us what your New Year's resolution is. And if you're willing, and you don't keep New Year's resolutions, let us know why. Um, I think it's a good practice to get into in life, not just at New Year's, but I think it's always good to look at your life and and see areas where you'd like to get better, stronger, however, you know, whatever it is. But I, I don't think it has to be once a year. Um, so I guess I'm a believer in resolutions. Um, I, I don't particularly have one this year. I mean, I've been working on probably the most popular resolution there is and that's getting in better shape but i've been working on that for the past well four or five months so i guess my new year's resolution is to keep on that and uh keep slugging my big carcass on a treadmill each and every day um so that i can be around for years and years to come to talk to you guys about all sorts of tomfoolery um Here's the other thing that's weird about me. It's, it's a lot of new things happening now. Lots of new stuff coming out. New seasons of TV shows, all the new fishing shows. I'm horrible at promoting my own stuff, so I'm just going to do that right now. The new season of Facts of Fishing the Show starts this week on Outdoor Channel in the United States of America and Sportsnet 360 in Canada and also on the World Fishing Network. So make sure to check that out. I would really appreciate it. Um, a great season. Another fun season, a great group of group of people I get to work with to put that show together. And um, and really, that show really funds the ability for me to do this. Um, so I'm thankful for all of that. But uh, check out the new season of Facts of Fishing, the show. Check out all the new shows. Zona's new season's out. There's a lot of great outdoor broadcasting that is out there right now. So check it out. Um, the other new thing and the big thing has to do with this week's guest. I thought of nobody different to start this season off. We always try to start with, you know, a banger guest to kick off the season. Well, 
when it came to 2024, I'm like, there's one dude, literally one dude. Sometimes it's like we could go this way or this way, but there's one person that I wanted to kick off the season, and it's this week's guest, Rick Clun. Why? Well, <laughs> why is the dumbest question ever? Because he is Rick Clun, and he is always amazing to speak. Any moment I spend with him, I, I feel I leave there more knowledgeable and more grounded. But this season, a very special celebration for Rick Clun. His 50th competition season. 50 years of fishing Bassmaster events. Unheard of, unfathomable. Not only his 50th year, but on the St. John's River, it will be his 500th Bassmaster event. So a lot to celebrate. And I just thought there is no better guest to kick it off with than the legendary Mr. Rick Clun. Um, he is truly a special, special person. I mean, what he's accomplished in this sport, what he continues to accomplish, it doesn't happen in any other sport. Like, literally, there is nobody else out there that has five decades of competition. And that is this week's guest, the legendary Mr. Rick Clun. I'm a little bit nervous. Here goes. Rick Clun, I, uh, as I started the last time we did this, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. And I, I don't know if you realize this, but I mean, I just try to have conversations on this show, but I actually get a little nervous uh, doing conversations with you. Not because, <laughs> but because I feel like, I mean, I watched our last thing and all I felt the whole way through it is I should shut up and let Rick speak more because you give us so much knowledge and riches. So, so thank you for doing that. Well, it's just another view. And I, I like it when you get nervous, especially when we're on stage together, because that shows the human side of you. <laughs> well, I, I think we all have a human side and, uh, I'll 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 throw it out, out there. I know this is not the right way to start this. Literally before I start all things, I try to think of a question, you know, to get us going in a direction. And all that keeps going through my mind, and I know this is totally the wrong way to start this, but I'm just gonna give you what I'm thinking. All that keeps going through my mind is Rick Clun, 50 years. Holy shit. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm the same way. I I Part of me is amazed and part of me is humbled and part of me almost doesn't don't want anybody to know it. And I don't know what that part is, but it's it's really kind of strange because sometimes something like that, it, it, there's a lot of good intentions come your way, but also a lot of, uh, they make you into something that you're really not and i think it's 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 overdone a certain and um, uh, to a certain degree i hate to compare it to mummification but it's like why why did they do that mummification deal because they thought it'd give you some sort of immortality and and we call the fames give you some sort of immortality and so when you celebrate something like this and it's it is don't i'm not under mind in it because I, I'm amazed by it but I, I've just been doing something I love to do and a lot of it, a lot of it was very selfishly you know how fishermen are you know we, we commit to it and uh, and there's a lot of sacrifices made so there's 50 years of, of achievement but there's a lot also a lot of it was uh, you know it was selfish. I mean, I, I, I've had, you know, the Bass Federation, I've always known them as, as a very unselfish group. And they they always, I've known some that were incredibly unselfish in what they did for conservation and for young anglers and for everything else. And every time I was around them, I felt guilty because, yeah, they said, man, I do love to do what I do, but I did, and it sounds bad, but I did it mostly for me, <laughs> you know? Hopefully, a lot of it of the aftershock was good for those other things. Uh, if you did it the right way, then at least they're observing the right way to do it. Uh, and that's really my oldest child, Sage, the other day asked me, what are you most proud of? 
and that's a, that's a tough one after 50 years. Uh, and, and he said in fishing, you know, you want yeah. to make sure you know the category. It's not necessarily, you know, his birth or, or, or family or something, because there's a lot of those things that would take precedent over. But in fishing, and it really was, uh, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And in early on, I, I, I there, you know, back when we drew co drew other pros, and they were determined you had to sit there and discuss whose boat you're going to take, who's going to get what half of the day, and he gets his half of the day. And it, the psychology that went on to me was amazing. I mean, and 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 and, and a lot of people, you know. Uh, I actually had a deal on Facebook. You may have seen this week where I observed a young angler winning our tournament and he got out of the boat the second day of the weigh-in and his mentor, who was a legend, walked up to him because he he had observed his, uh, this young angler and, and that young angler's partner that day, his partner shook his hand and said, I had a great day of fishing. And anyway, after the partner walked off, the mentor walked up to the young angler and said, you effed up. If, if your partner ever tells you he's had a great day, you effed up. And I just, I mean, it shocked me because, and I, I made I made a conscious decision that day. I will, I, I will not have a good day because it's at, at the expense of, of treating my partner poorly. And so I, that it was a good moment for me to, and that's what I eventually told my son uh, was that that's probably the thing I'm most proud of is I, I, I tried to, even back then, I tried that day, you were my partner. We weren't competitors against each other, other even though we were. Uh, and uh, let's work together. Well, I'll beat you tomorrow or you beat me tomorrow. But this day, let's work together and let's have a good day. And that really occurred probably 98% of the time. Yeah, there was always that 2% that you and the partner just could not get along. Uh, and my best partners, ironically, were the big the big time guys, the Denny Briars, the Larry Nixons, uh, the, the big partners we worked together was about. Uh, it's really that I and my partners. You still there? I, I'm still here. We lost you for a split second there, but 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 I'm still here, uh, and I think I got the gist of of what you were saying. Do you think that your ability to work with these anglers, your ability to not make it about me against you, do you think that's changed at all in the sport? Well, you don't have to do it anymore. You know, because you don't have those partners in the boat. So I don't even know if we have the opportunity to learn. You, these young anglers, they know they're taking their boat. They don't have to sit there and use psychology or intimidation to get that guy to say, yeah, we'll take your boat. That's That was the hardest part because you, all your equipment's in your boat. You're familiar with it back then. So I had guys, you know, I had drew one guy uh, that – he, he just ins insisted he had to take his boat because it was camouflage color. And uh, and he even had a camouflage suit for me to wear if I went with him. And uh, anyway, fortunately, we had to flip because you couldn't make up your mind. The rule said you had to flip. And I won, fortunately. But I even had to ask him that day, why is your boat, the bottom of it, looks like a camouflage uniform for a, a, a bow hunter in the woods? Why didn't it got shad painted all over the bottom? You know, if you're just gonna if it's gonna be in the water, you, why not have shad all over the bottom or something? But anyway, you got in all kinds of situations like that. And nowadays, these young anglers, they don't have to go through that. They they know that they're taking their boat. And uh, and they know they're gonna get their fish through the water 100 percent of the day. Back then, you you were hoping you'd just get your water 50% of the day. Uh, and uh, so it was a lot different uh, way you had to work with partners, and and it you really found out about human nature, you know. Uh, and uh, I mean, you you really and the one thing I got good at was telling liars, telling guy that was a lying, and lying, or trying to deceive you. But you learned to ask same questions over and over, and if he was lying, you'd get a different answer. 
And then you'd really start pushing. And I didn't want to push a guy if he was telling the truth, but I'm going to push him if I thought he was being dishonest about where we're going to start. I want to go to my water, blah, 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 that kind of thing. So you got real good at studying human behavior. You became part psychologist. Uh, you know, so uh, that doesn't, you know, it does, it's, it's the same today. It's not in that respect. What it is the same today is how you treat the other guys on the water around you. Yeah, uh, and the fact that there's more and more anglers on the water nowadays, it is so important. And see, and I may be not a good example uh, because the anglers, I guess, because I've been at it fifty years, they give me a lot of respect. But I think sometimes they wouldn't give another angler. Yeah, I think that's probably true. But don't you think you've earned said respect? Well, you earn it if you give it back to them, even though you, he's a first timer. Uh, you got you, you, you got. I I try to treat them the same way as I, you know, as the old saying, you know, treat them like you'd want to be treated, and and that's what, and that's what I try to do. I, you know, I, I don't try to crowd somebody. We're fishing in the area. Let's have a conversation so we don't start bumping into each other and think we're intruding or doing or, you know, let's okay, let's have a conversation. We're in the same area. We know we're going to be bumping into each other. Let's talk about how we want to work. It's going to work for both of us. So, you know, communication in, in life is everything. And it's no, absolutely in fishing it is. Do you think the sport in some ways misses? Is it a good thing that we don't have draws like we initially, like when your career started, when you had to share a boat with somebody? Is there good things from that that we're missing now? There is some good things. Uh, even back when you, they went to co-anglers, uh, a lot of guys looked at the co-anglers as a negative, but I, I never looked at the co-anglers as negative. And, and, the main, and even if it was another pro, or you, if I drew a Denny Briar, I knew I had twice the chance to get on the fish tomorrow. I could, he was going to give me knowledge and information, and I was going to share mine with his, uh, with him. And so it, it's in other words, I made uh, let's say in three days of practice, I made 10,000 casts. Well, if I draw a guy like Denny, that's 10,000 opportunities for information I give myself. If I draw somebody like Denny or Larry Nixon or somebody like that, now I've got 10,000 more uh, in, uh, opportunities for information that day. And we were always pretty honest with each other. Uh, I never felt that. I mean, I knew the minute we started talking that, hey, he's leveling. He's like me. He wants to maximize this day. And we the best way to do that is just put our two brains together and do it. And uh, and even with the co-anglers, uh, so you weren't always on fish the first day. Or even if you were, you weren't totally intimate with them yet. And that co-angler gives you another cast. And every fish, even though a lot of guys, they'll catch a fish behind you. I even heard my younger brother one time goes, man, he caught a six pounder behind. He caught my fish. It was a six pounder behind me. I go, Randy, that wasn't your fish. I said, but, but and yeah, and it, it, it's, we all do that. I wish I'd caught that fish, but we're not catching every fish. I've had nine pounders caught behind me. And uh, that, but what you got to look at, that's information. Okay. Look at the information that fish give, gave you from, and a lot of times in my co-anglers, uh, I want to determine that Lake Livingston be ASS. And my first day co-angler, uh, actually uh, uh, named Marsha Finn, changed page but that day on me, and that put me on the right bait that, that I ended up winning in that tournament. So there, yes, I missed that, that that opportunity for for information that was always there or, or was a lot of times. One of the things you said at the very start of this conversation was, it was all selfish. Do do you feel like and 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 insert sport here, Michael Jordan, whoever, you know, Tiger Woods, you name the athlete, the sport. Do you think to reach a certain level at some of these things, it's not mentioned as selfish very often, but there is a selfishness that has to be in you to do that. Yeah, I do. Maybe that's the wrong word. But that's what I often felt, uh, you know, when I would get around an unselfish angler like Charlie Campbell. 
like a, another one, a friend of mine in, in Texas, Ed Pardon. They did so much for their fellow anglers on and off the water. I, I, I was totally focused on the water and on how to get better. And, uh, and, and I think to reach the pinnacle of what you do, yes, there's an element of that there. Maybe I'm using the wrong word. Yeah, I think I think you can put a different adjective with it and it has a whole different feeling. I mean, dedication is the exact same. It, it's right. it's blocking out everything yeah. else. And now when you say somebody's dedicated, it's it's much more of a celebration than saying somebody's selfish just because of, of what people think. But I, I think to chase any of those things, and, and I don't know if it's – this is a weird time for us to have this conversation, Rick, because I don't even know if you know this, but this is – your 50th year of obviously of competition. I turned 50 a week ago and, and I feel like I'm going through. It's just a real weird. You feel like I feel there's a selfishness in my life. I feel like, you know, like my, my kids don't care that I work at bass and have done all these, you know, that they just want you home. Um, but I think that's also part of that selfishness is what drives people. Like, I mean, you, you, do you do you believe that I mean you could have just been just as happy a person if you would have stayed working in where was it AT and T or so? who were you working for back in the day Exxon Exxon okay would you have been just as happy a person today if you had no, stayed I'd be, in that I'd be dead. you'd be dead. I'd be dead That's not. No, even... I, 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 you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. I've gone back, and almost every one of the people I worked with that stayed there died. Wow! And, and that's that opens up a whole other can of worms. But uh, I, I think what fishing did for me, again, me and my and Sage the other day, he was asking me, "What am I happy?" He asked me a lot of strange questions, and uh, and that, that just if anybody asks you that question, it's a tough, almost an impossible one to answer. And there's and there's a reason there is because you know even in our early governmental days, we said you know this country is going to give you life, liberty, and not happiness. That it's going to give you life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's what fishing did. And I'm a, I hate to say this was staying at Exxon probably would have taken away that pursuit of happiness. And but fishing gave me the ability to keep pursuing it. How and occasionally you do touch it. Okay? And that's true in your in all all parts of your life, you know, your family and your friends and uh and all and you you pursue it there too in a different way, maybe. And, uh, but the, the, the best, what, what, and I know what you do is get done the same thing for you. I can just tell by looking in your eyes and, and the way you talk at times and what, what you do, but, you know, and, but the, 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 there's a, the, the problem with that pursuit is that it needs to touch ever, ever level of your life. And I, I didn't realize that until. And I'm still not great at it, but and I've, you, you've heard this story that when my daughter, my youngest daughter, Courtney, I'd come home from two or three weeks at tournaments and she'd crawl up in my lap and the, when I sat down on the couch, but she was still giving me the cold shoulder. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't look at me. And uh, but I'd just gotten home and one time she did that and I turned on the TV. I knew there was a fishing show coming on and I flipped it on and I knew I was going to be on it. And sure enough, here I'm on TV all of a sudden, and she starts tapping me. She perks up and starts tapping me real fast. Dad, Dad, look, there's Rick Lund. And I laughed at first, and then I went, wait a minute, that's not funny. That person on TV is not the, the person that she's sitting in the lap of to her. That person on TV is damn good at what they do. But it's the lap she's sitting in, father, how good is he at what he does? And then it hit me hard. That how good am I? I? Yeah, I'm a pretty damn good at getting angry. But how good a father are you? How good a friend are you? How good a you know a husband are you? And that's slowly 
being it brought me back to I, I I have to pursue that part of my life as hard as I pursue this early part. And you're right, it just all people, it's just not fishermen, all successful people, men or women, it takes hard work and commitment. And those are the adjectives that doesn't make to that justify it. Uh but at the same time, it, that creates that hard work and commitment it, it is create sacrifices in a lot of the other areas of your life. And so at some point in time, you need to start to try to balance it out a little bit, or at least you need to start looking at those parts of your life just as important. So, yeah, I, uh, and that's why I still love what I to do what I do because it is, it's the pursuit of, of, of that word happiness, I guess, even though it's, it's like love. There's so many different meanings in the word love and happiness. Did, did that change through your career? Did, did you know? I, I mean, I think I know the answer, but obviously, for you to say you had to invest as much into your personal life as how does that happen? Like, I mean, it has to happen through just a feeling in you, or. or I don't know that I'm still doing it right. So I don't know if I can tell you the answer to that. Uh, because are you going to spend as much time in those other areas as you've spent getting to this level of whatever your what you love to do is? Uh, and uh, and it's not easy because you're dealing with other human beings. Yeah, <laughs> you know. You, in fishing, I was uh, I was I was one of the very first social distancers on the earth in this country. You know, long before COVID, we were social distancing. But now, dealing with these other elements of your life, you're not social distancing. You're interacting with other human beings, and that's a much greater challenge than interacting with a little green fish. So it's 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 something that I have I've had to start working on and still working on to this day. Do you think that's why, as anglers age, statistically, certain things start to drop off? Just because the, I mean the, and and again, I don't think it's any different than any other competitive activity, but the level of commitment and obsession you need to have to be successful at this sport is all-consuming, and you can most likely only do that to a certain level, and. And keep everything else you around you still there, your house, your family, your everything. No, absolutely. Uh it, it you know, that's definitely one one of the things that controls that that level that you're you're can you maintain that level? I don't I theoretically, scientifically, I would say age is not what's gonna prevent you from that. Not in fishing. Uh, what's going to prevent you from that is embracing the other parts of your life and the amount of energy now you need to take away from this part, which is fishing, and start giving to those other parts. And, uh, and sure, uh, that's the one thing I do like about uh, forward facing sonar, strange transition, in it, is that. It's, even though I, I I can't put the same energy in at making 2,000 casts a day that I used to, forward facing sonar is showing us you weren't very efficient at making 2,000 casts a day. You were not, you were, even if even if Kevin and I were, when we were mastering, Kevin Van Dam and I were mastering uh, pattern fishing and increasing high probability casts through pattern fishing and science, we were still throwing at a, a, a very small percentage of our cast were actually at the fish. So now I look at the forward facing stuff and I go, Cody Huff never, he may only make 200 casts, yeah. but he's never not throwing at a fish. My, and my, and my, my, my body goes, Rick, well, I'd like to sit in that chair and use that little spinning rod and not wearing my shoulders out. And but right now my mind still won't let it. <laughs> it says, no, you can't do that. You got to get up there and fish the way you've always fished. So I think, but the, the the point in that is is I can still fish at a high level, but I'm gonna have to relearn how to fish. 
I can't do it the way I was used to doing it. And, uh, and, and my body definitely is not going to prevent me from fishing that style. Uh, there are a few things like your eyes, but I, I just put in robot eyes this winter. So my eyes are going to be a lot better next year. Uh, so, you know, and, but anyway, no, it's, uh, it's definitely, and, and but I, I started off with the Kansas City Chiefs and how we were looking at them and not having a great year. And, but also our ex expectations, can they ever match our, the fans' expectations. Can Mac, you know, Patrick Mahomes, we think he's going out, out there. And I even had a, a, a lady anger one time at one of our tournaments. Look at Melissa. I hadn't had a good tournament. And she looked over at the last day of the tournament. She looked over at Melissa and said, he's going to pull a rabbit out of his ass. He always does. That was their expectations. Rick Lund's going to do that. Well, that's the same way with Patrick Mahomes. We think he's going to pull a bunny rabbit out of his tail ever, ever tournament. So your expectations really start to bear down on you, and uh, and, and your own is in the beginning. It's your own that's the worst, but uh, over time, it's everybody starts to think you're going to pull a miracle. And I know Kevin and and all these anglers that reach that level have, have has felt that that negative energy, and it 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 takes its toll uh, at, at these anglers at the at the top of the game. When. And, and you very much had that time in your career, very, very long stretch where people just like was said, he'll pull something out at the last minute. Did you feel that yourself when you were competing? Yes. I, like I said, my expectations were worse than anybody else's. Uh, because and I still do. I, I, at least at a consciously competent level, I don't believe, and this sounds pompous, nobody ever understood what I understood. Uh, and uh, now some of them understand it at a subconscious level, but it's like my friend Mike Dice said, you got to go from being con unconsciously competent to consciously competent. And I, I eventually achieved consciously competent. So yes, I knew what it would take to make it happen. And I knew the energy it would take and I, it, it, that it would happen. Did it always happen? No, but I kept believing it would. And most, and a lot of times it did. Is believing it will happen the most important part of, about it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the most important, but it's truly, it's believing it's thinking something into existence, but what did, what does it take to do that? It takes a a pure mind and a pure heart. You got to truly believe it, and and you can't fool whatever is over this whole process. You can't fool it. I mean, everybody wants to win the lottery, but most of us know we're not going to. <laughs> so if you had that 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 negative influence there, you're not going to. Okay, uh, and so. The purity of your, and this gets into the quantum physics and Einstein, I'm not going to go there, but it's still the purity of your thought is what directs your energy and matter to form. And, uh, and so it's the purity of your intention. And some people translate that into prayer. Prayer is incredible if it's pure, how much of it is. That's That would be my only question. And the same thing is in, in true with the, uh, with uh, what I was, you know, understanding when it came to thinking something into existence in a fishing boat. So throughout your career, what's been more important for you, the, the mental side of things or your physical abilities? The mental, the mental side, physical, the physical side is, is relevant, but, uh, it's also robotic. And if you don't add the intelligence to it, that's all it is, it's a robot that's programmed to do one thing and one thing only. And it may do it very well, but it, it, it has no ability to have a, an original thought. And in fishing, you better have some original thoughts because uh, every day is different. And you can't be have a program and that body at night and next day go out 
and, and all it can do is what you program it to do that night. You got to be able to reprogram it by the minute. And that's, you know, you, you hear the term fishing in the moment. That the only way that happens is you if you're mentally doing that. So mental is 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 everything. So what person if you had to break it down, what percentage would you say mental is versus versus physical in this sport? Ten percent physical, ninety percent mental. Wow. And that's just rough. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I may be given physical even more than it should be given. And I, but I, I don't mean that because you have to be in good physical shape to execute sometimes what the mind wants you to do. Uh, and, uh, and that's where, when I broke my back here three years ago, I, I realized my mind still knew what to do, but my body couldn't execute it. And, and that's, it gave me, it, 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 you'd think it would sadden you and it frustrates me. It did frustrate me, but it, gosh, it made me so appreciative of how good my body's been to me most of my life until I mess up and do something to hurt it. So, uh, yeah, it, the body has to be, it, like any athlete, You, if you know the game mentally, you still have to have a body in shape to physical, physically do it. And, uh, I, I fished with uh, Randy White, a Dallas Cowboy, uh, All-American and All-Pro tackle and several times when I was guiding. And he'd get out of the boat at the end of the day and said, Rick, I thought I was in good shape. I'm, I'm so dang tired. And I said, Randy, you are in good shape, but your shape is based on performing at a high level for three hours. My shape, I have to perform nine, 10, 12 hours in all all different extremes of heat, cold, rough water, sun, whatever. I said, I've got to be, my body has to be in shape for that. So, uh, yes, your body has to be in shape to do what we do. And everybody looks at it and thinks it's, it, there's not that much physically involved, but you no. Know, if you do it at that at the level that pros do it at, uh, you got to be in shape for 12 hours, you know, and multi days in a row. I, when I'm casting, making 2,000 casts, especially in the old days when we had those little six foot rods, pistol grip handles, I was making a, I was making 2,000 pitches a day because I'm using that same motion that a major league pitcher uses. He makes 100 pitches and he's out. They take him out and he's got to rest for three or four days. We never rest. We got to get out the next day and make 2,000 more pitches and 2,000 more. And uh, so, thank goodness the long handle rods come in and saved us a little bit there. I, I've always thought watching you guys, and one of the things that makes I, I I agree. Everybody that I've talked to kind of agrees on the mental side of it being so much more important. But I think that that's why you also see physical when somebody has a physical ailment, whether it be a back, an arm, a shoulder, whatever. In other sports, they can block it out, but in this sport, you can't block it out for two reasons. Number one, because of the longevity, as you said for the amount of hours you have to do it. And number two, the energy you spend blocking it out also takes away from its mental energy that you're wasting blocking out the fact that there's a pain that you're you're trying to avoid. And that's been my most frustrating thing this last three years is I, I will be on a real good light. You know, let's use St. Lawrence burning a spinnerbait and you got these four and five pound smallmouth just taking it out of your hands. And uh, I will, in, in the three day event, four day event, if you make it that far, by the third day, my body can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't do that. And golly, I was, it's so upsetting because I know how to catch them, but my body can't execute it. And that's the first, and again, I did not, it's strange to me, though, I started to appreciate my body more, even though it wasn't performing. Because all of a sudden, I started to have gratitude for how long it did perform without that mental distraction of pain. And I was fortunate. I, I knew other anglers that fished with pain. I didn't know what they were going through. I didn't know what it was costing me. But you, you, you nailed it. It's costing you focus. It's costing you concentration. It's costing you all those things that that allow you to solve that puzzle and uh, and then even when you solve it allow you to execute and uh and that's that's been my hardest thing the last two or three years is that 
I had I actually fished a tournament out west this fall at U.S. Open, and uh, the, the pain actually got so bad I had to drop out of the tournament. First one I've ever had to drop out of in my life, and uh, it's uh, but it just it's just part of it. And so and it's my job to try to figure out how to heal that at least to a degree that you know I don't want to ever drop out of another tournament. That's it's the worst feeling I've ever had. I, I know there's some there's a pro today, Trevor Lawrence for the Jacksonville, that he's gonna miss his first game today. And if they've ever since high school or college in pros, he, he's never missed a game due to injury. And I feel for him because I know and mentally I know a little bit of what he's feeling and it's not a good feeling. You say you've been lucky, but but I think that I mean, it, yes, there is obviously luck in everything in life, but you've also spent a lot of time doing things outside of fishing to prepare yourself both physically and mentally throughout your career. Have you not? Yes and no. Uh, you know, because I, I saw other anglers going to lifting weights and running and doing all this kind of stuff and 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 I, I only thing was is that every sport has a in other words if you're going to lift weights you better have a trainer to tell you the right weights to lift or or to develop the right muscles and you know otherwise you're going to develop things that may not it may actually be hurting you uh, so I, I try I, I the only thing I ever saw that and still believe that really prepared me and was staying on the water, staying in the heat, staying in the cold, standing in the boat, rocking back and forth in two foot waves, uh, you know, uh, feeling the wind when you're running across the lake, feeling, you know, training your body for all the different elements that you got to deal with. And that's why even my early career, you know, I'm going to practice on the worst days that there is. Because what if it's a tournament day? My body has to be know how to function during the worst weather, not just the best. You know, and unfortunately, fishing has got to be kind of a fair weather tournament. Kind of gotten to be a fair weather game now. It's taken away a lot of those abilities uh, because and and for the lawyers have gotten involved. But it's also there are some good reasons not to go out. Uh, and we, you know, they hold you on real rough water days or stormy lightning, and some of those are very justified. But at the same time, the, I had strategies in those weather. Okay, I knew how I was going to fish on those days. I even tell the young anglers now: practice, make sure the fish you're finding you can fish during the tournament. Become, you need to be a meteorologist. You know, we need to be a weather day of the tournament. The wind's going to totally switch around. I'm not going to be able to fish that bank. And if that's all you look for is fish on that kind of bank, you're in trouble. So I said, you got to practice for the weather of the tournament days, not the weather necessarily of the practice days. So again, it, just fishing was my best way of staying in shape. If, if I have to, you know, outside of just being on the water, which I thought probably made me more in shape than anything else, because there's no other way you can duplicate all the variables that you run into, heat, cold, hot, wind, that type of thing. But there was one thing I did that I would say really helped me a bunch that was off the water, and that was martial arts. Uh, I took uh, hop keto for like five or six years. And... Uh, and the one benefit I saw from that, it really translated over into fishing, was uh, the stretching, all the risk and the joint movement that you had to do in martial arts, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the moves you had to make and how quick you had to make them, really translated a lot to standing inside a boat. Uh, my, my muscles were stretched. Everybody, when you're in a boat, you're eventually going to take some falls. Slippery days, you're going to make the wrong, wrong, uh, you know, step and step on the gun. And I've had some, some of some really bad ones, and I didn't hurt anything. And I totally believe it was due to all the stretching and stuff that I still maintain, even at 77, a lot of it uh, from those six years of martial arts. Plus your your reflexes, 
you're setting the hook, you know, and 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 and, and uh, biting a fish. Martial arts really works on your reflexes. So I I, I didn't take. I, I got a black belt, uh, and, but uh, I I quit after that because my uh, teacher master Sam wanted me to go on to second degree black belt. And that meant more sparring. And I did, there was some catches to all that. I did break a rib and I did break a bone in my wrist in martial arts. So, but still, that was the one thing that I would say helped me more than anything else outside of just being on the water. What what about some of the stuff that floats around about you? And I'm and I'm sure you hear it, but like I hear <laughs> that you used to sleep outside to become one with nature. I've heard you 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 once fished naked true. like it, 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 any of these true like and tell me your theory behind it. yeah they're all true <laughs> all of it's true well definitely the sleeping outside i did that out of necessity when i didn't have any money at first i did uh, sleep in my vehicle a lot because i couldn't afford a motel in my early career i was broke and uh, and that, but that translated into some real benefits, and that was that I stayed acclimated to the weather. I didn't go back into a, on a thirty degree night. I didn't go back into a seventy de seventy degree motel room and sleep all night, and then have to walk out to a twenty five degree morning and have to body had to adjust. I was already in. It. And uh, one of my favorite deals was Larry Nixon one time said, "How in the world do you sleep out there and it?" 22 degrees this morning. It's only going to get to, it's only going to get to 40 today. I said, Larry, think about what you just said. I said, it's going to get warmer for me today. You came out of a 70 degree room. It's not going to get warmer for you today. <laughs> oh, uh, so there was a lot to that. The naked part, yeah, I was guilty of that one time on Sam Raven. I was young, young guy. You know how we 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 got, kind of, but you also I got a qualified back then. I was on Sam Raven, a giant lake full of timber still back then. And back in that day, and it was in the weekdays, there's nobody on the water like there is nowadays. Nowadays, you know, you, there's people on the water every day, every day. And uh, back then there wasn't. And I took off my shirt and my pants, and I have still had on shorts. And I said, I, the heck, I'm just going to take off everything and get a good suntan today. Well, I got a good one. I couldn't sit down for three days. <laughs> so, <laughs> that part, part of my body that had never seen the sun made me pay for it. So, yeah, some of that's true. And some of it's exaggerated. I, 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 I would have bet that the naked thing wasn't true, but, but I, I just found it. what, what? So I don't, I don't understand though. What part of your brain was saying, you know what? Who needs underwear? I mean, why, right. why, why? Why? Well, you know, it's uh, everybody. In, we live in a country in an age where, you know, there's certain tans that are just your arms and the rest of your body's white. And there are certain tans where your your face and, ne and neck are sunburned, but the rest of your body's white. And, and you get, you know, the, we criticize those. Golly, that's bad looking. So you go. And then we, you know, everybody loves this, this all over tan. So that's what I was, I was young. I was thinking I was still, uh, you know, caught up with the way I looked. And, uh, but I, and I did, you know how sun, it, sun is, it's sneaky. You know, I kept looking at the white part of my body to see if it, and of course, it didn't show up until it was too late. So I, I didn't do that. I don't, I never did that again. So <laughs> that broke me. No, nothing you'd recommend then, I take it. Uh, no, I'm not going to advise anybody on uh, what, what they wear or don't wear. <laughs> how do you deal throughout your career? How have you dealt with the, the highs? and the lows well you deal you know you deal with them and of course sports psychology takahiro is the first one i ever the knew of an anger to start going to a sports psychologist yeah and uh and of course i studied a lot of uh, uh buddhism and zen and buddhism is based on the laws of non-attachment you don't attach yourself to the highs and lows pleasure and pain you know, you maintain this level of feeling about everything, which I didn't I didn't embrace because I like feeling things. It's all about not feeling things. And, that, and I'm misinterpreting it. So if you're Buddhist, excuse me. 
but uh, uh, at the same time, I slowly did learn, start to learn though that the highs, yes, uh, were good. They gave you confidence. They 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 gave you belief that you were doing the right things. Uh, and the lows did the opposite. Uh, they took away. They, they had the potential to take away that confidence. But uh, at the same time, it made you really evaluate your performance much more than the wins did. You know, in other words, you know, we, we all learn more from the losses than we do from the wins. It was it was a much greater teacher than than the wins were. So that's the way I always tried to look at them. You still, you know, you still kind of have your own private pity parties, you know. At, for a while, but you got to get over those, and you got to look. Okay, what did I do wrong? What do I need to improve? And uh, and that's true in everything. And that's a good. Without them, I don't think we'd ever have any growth. Have you ever gone through points in your career where you thought about giving up? Twice. Uh, no. What? No. You talking to me? My wife's hollering at me. <laughs> so but yeah twice uh one time i was at gunnersville and uh and it's when gunnersville became so so popular and uh and it, it was just there was no ever hole in the lake was a community hole and you'd go fish a hole one day and you get back there the next day and there'd be five boats on it you know and and it, that's okay, I, it, but, the, but the fact that they start chewing you out, even though they've watched you fish it the day before, you know, that was frustrating. And then I got back to the campground, and I was one of the first campers there ever was. This time of year, you'd not, never, ever, in March and February and April, you'd never see hardly anybody else in the campground. And all these camp, our big RV campers, I heard a group of them going, why do they allow these fishermen in this campground? And I mean, I... I <laughs> But it just hit me wrong. I went, okay, I was here long before you guys ever were here. You know, I was in these campgrounds long before you. So it was just a, a bunch of different things. And I didn't do well in the tournament. And Larry Nixon was saying the same thing about the, the, the boat traffic and people, you know, crowding you and people, you know, sitting. And I just said, and then, and, and then, then, then that, the other thing, the other time was, uh, it was again a classic and it was on Logan Martin in Alabama and I took off the first day and there was 35 boats behind me and Larry Nixon took off and there was 35 boats behind him and about halfway through the day I changed spots and these 35 five boats are still following me and I'm running up the river and I come around the bend and guess who I meet Larry Nixon with 35 boats heading at us and it looked like two huge flocks of quail running into each other and boats and were going everywhere and uh, and it, it scared me. I thought somebody's going to get killed. And that, that evening, Larry even said, "He said, if it, I don't know if I can continue doing this if it's that way." And fortunately, it, it it wasn't. It didn't stay that way. But yes, there's been times when you hear some of the stuff that is prevalent today, where people say, "You know, the sports change is not the sport I fell in love with." I mean, a lot, a lot of targets are painted on forward facing sonar as being a major reason for that. And, and the only reason I went in this direction, because when you say, you know, you and Larry were thinking that but we're in a time right now where there's people that, that feel that way. H how do you feel about the future of this sport? Oh, I, I feel it's good. Uh, we've, uh, you know, and, and I think it's way too early for, for me to give you an opinion on forward facing. I think it would be premature to do that uh, because I can remember a time, okay? I think it's, it's given us, yeah, people are looking at it in all different ways, but right now it's a great source of information for me. It's a great thing to show me how mis, how much I misunderstood deep fish my whole career, even when I was guiding. We, we understood a little bit about them due to Buck Perry and other people that said, yeah, they go deep. But we were mostly wrong. Yeah, they went deep, but they weren't always deep. They could be over 60 foot of water, 10 foot deep under a bunch of shad. So it's given us so much more 
honest information about the behavior of deep fish. I love that information. And I don't want to, like I said, can it go too far? Sure it can. Everything can go too far. Uh, Republicans go too far. Democrats go too far. Is it the Republicans? No, it's the extremist. In any philosophy, any group of people who have ideologies, the, most people, that's, you know, the, the, the part they like is good, but the, you have extremes on both ends. And sure, and in technology, you can do the same thing. And for facing, yeah, there could be an extreme here that maybe we need to control the amount of transducers you can put on a boat. Uh, just like you saw it when the Alabama rate came out. You know, everybody wanted to outlaw it, and everybody in tournaments, some tournaments did. And but then they started, states started to control the amount of hooks you could have on one. I, I didn't. I still think it should be allowed, but I, I don't think it should be allowed with. 25 hooks on one, you know, it's, it's so the, the extremes is what we have to really look at in it. But right now, overall, I think it's, it's a very positive, uh, you know, part of, uh, of fishing. Uh, the other thing about that was 1977, I won my second Bassmaster Classic. Carl Lorenz, the founder of the little green box step finder, little flasher, wanted me to come to Tulsa and fish with him. And so I did. I'll never forget what he's one of the first things he said. He says, I'm so disappointed in you anglers. And I went, why? He says, because you're not using my equipment the right way. He says, it's not just to see the bottom, it's to see fish. And I think back to him. And also I can remember, even with the little flasher, there were states up north that wanted to, to outlaw it and ban it. Even with that little <laughs> flasher unit that was so primitive, because they were afraid of it. And, but I still think back to Carl right now, if he could see what's out there today, would he, he wouldn't be against it. He would say they're finally using it the right way. No, so, so, no. So what we're dealing with now, do, or, do you think, do you think this is any bigger than what you saw with the flasher or, or, or like, why does this seem like such a big topic nowadays? Because it's 360 degree view. I mean, it's the flash year was just a vertical down view, and and even then there were there were certain states and conservation departments that wanted to outlaw it because they thought it would be the ruination of fishing, and uh, so it's you know it's again just fear fear of technology, you know, and even even Einstein said that you know technology has two sides, one side can save us and one side can destroy us. So even that applies to pet planters that are afraid it's going to destroy all this fishing that we have. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it will. I think fish have always shown the ability to adjust. I already see it. And I went crappie fishing yesterday with a, with a crappie whisperer guy here on both shows and forward facing. And, uh, and there's still, you still got to know what you're doing. I mean, you just can't put one on the boat and the fish start jumping in the boat. No, you better you better be awful good at what you're interpreting, what you're seeing, how you're using it. There's a there, there's a real art form to to doing it the right way. And if, if, there's no anger out there. If I if I would go up there and say, okay, what if I could give you eyes that show you underwater what you can see with your eyes above the water? Would you take it? There wouldn't be a single one that would say, no, yeah, yeah, I take it. But I mean, not knowing what we're what we're seeing nowadays, where is it going to go? I don't know. You know, it, it could go to the extremes, and I think maybe the extremes of twelve hooks on the Alabama Ridge is too much should be should be some kind of controls. But that's always dangerous when you start doing that. Yeah, and and I think the Alabama what I've used is with the Alabama rig as kind of a case study for this. There is a lot of people that think the Alabama rig was prematurely made illegal. You don't want to see that. Ha I mean, there and and there's a lot of people who want to make forward facing sonars illegal. And and I, I agree with you. There needs to be more data and more actual, rather than just feelings. People have feelings towards it, and you know it all depends where it goes. And and we're learning more. You know, we're learning about all of the mistakes that were made in fishing in the past. You know that fish. I mean, Champlain oh, yeah. last year was prime example. I mean, people talked about the fish being up on the shoal. Well, yeah, they're there sometimes, but there's an awful lot of them that aren't aren't there clearly that 
that haven't been getting targeted for years and years in the past. No, we just need to be patient. And I love, like I said, the knowledge. It showed me that the earth's not flat in the fishing arena. It's round, uh, especially when it comes to deep, deep fish. And it's just so dangerous if you start to censor knowledge. And that's what a lot of that's what will happen if we go to the extreme in this. What I've always wondered about you, Rick, and hopefully you'll 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 do this for me. Take me through your daily routine. I mean, I think what you're doing is one of the most amazing things in the history of sport, not just fishing, but there's nobody competing at the top level like you have for five decades. What does your day start like and what does your day finish like? I have to ask Melissa's permission if I can say tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what I'm saying. But uh really uh in it, in its changes and like you say, age has caused caused you to change to a certain degree. Uh I still don't sleep outside anymore, but I still try to spend a lot of time out in cold weather, you know, hiking and cutting wood and chopping wood or just, uh, you know, we, we do a certain amount of harvesting our own meat here and, you know, cleaning it and that kind of thing. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's, it, COVID really woke, woke, woke me up to that more than anything else. For the first time in my career, we had almost six months off that we weren't fishing tournaments. In the first two or three weeks are, are okay. You're back home, your family's home, my sons came home from college. And uh, and they were kind of okay and fun, but after about three weeks, you get tired of being around even your, the people you love the most. Uh, and certainly, you know, home was Melissa's domain. And now we were sitting there getting in the way and, you know, dirtying twice as many dishes and, and all of that. And But then for me, all of a sudden, I uh, slowly start to realize that my body was, it's hard to keep at 77 your body in shape like you were when you were younger. And when you start to take time off, it deteriorates a lot faster than when you were younger. The lights and COVID, the lights started to go off in certain rooms in the house and quickly. And if you're not using the rooms, uh, you know, you know, nature thinks you don't need them anymore. So I realized pretty quickly that I had the number one thing life for me was challenging yourself both mentally and physically every day and fishing allowed me to do that to a certain degree and to a high degree matter of fact uh and so i realized that it, that was the most important thing was finding some way to challenge myself mentally and physically every day that's what makes life worthwhile if you're not challenging yourself mentally and physically that's the one fallacy i see in uh and in this country's ideal of retirement is that we didn't, we were not explaining it correctly. We didn't set it up correctly. It's okay. And this, I heard just the other day, matter of fact, this old gentleman that lives in a, in a house out here in the Ozarks, he worked for 30 years. And he said the one thing he would change in his life is that he would never work over five years at any one thing. He said, then I'm going to change to something else. Then I'm going to change to something else. Otherwise, you get stagnant. You lose interest. You lose your enthusiasm. And there's a few exceptions to that. Me and you, we've done something for 50 years. And uh, it has slow moments. But overall, it's very stimulating. And that's really the key. If you retire, have something good to go to, something stimulating. And it, you know, these early retirement deals, we're losing some of the sharpest minds on the planet. That, that the corporate America forces to retire. So I try to answer your question about what I do. I try to do different things. And fortunately, I have a partner that really pushes me to, uh, you know, Melissa to, to do more things, to, you know, stay more active, to go, still go on adventures. You know, 
I quit giving Christmas present to my daughters when they were 13 years old because I got so upset at the way they tore them open. And, and then I started thinking, and I never gave them another Christmas present after that Christmas, except because I started thinking, what, what did, could I remember my parents gave me? I couldn't remember anything. Really, I mean, I say it was a deer rifle or if your parents were well enough to give you a car. But everything else that you tore to those packages and threw over your shoulder, I couldn't remember a single gift. But I could remember the hunting trips. I could remember the camping trips. I could remember the fishing trips. And so my first present to my family after that Christmas that I, blew, that I lost it, and I did, uh, I gave them an envelope under the tree. They opened it. And we were, it was a trip to wrap the full length of the Grand Canyon, seven days. So from that point on, I kept giving them an adventure. And I tell them, you may not like this one, but you'll never forget it. And so, again, so Melissa's real good at motivating me to that same philosophy. You know, she's climbing out and killing the jar. And now I can't go 19,000 feet, you know. But and those are the kind of adventures that uh, I, I still want to do. Uh, you know, we still always try to do one or two a year, whale watching, something like that. Is there one that's so, like, well, do you have a bucket list one that you haven't done yet? Do I? I still, and it's, I still have some national parks that I haven't seen, and I've seen most of them, even in this country. I still have some of those. I would love to take my camper that I use at tournaments and go, not just go there and look out and then drive off, but go and spend a couple of days in the camper. And that's still not enough to get intimate with something. But some of my fishing, one of the greatest gifts it's given me is the Grand Canyon, is Lake Powell, is Lake Mead. It's St. Lawrence River, uh, the Adirondack Mountains, the Green Mountains. Uh, you know, that's the greatest gift it's given me is, is, is those things. You know, yeah, I love the trophies, but I'd never trade those for the trophies. Uh, so uh, that's another benefit of fishing. And what I do is it, it's allowed me to see parts of this country I would have never seen. When you... Uh... When you retire from this sport, will you, will you leave this sport a wealthy man? No. No, I don't have any respect for money. Never have, never will. And that, that, that not a, that's not something positive. That's a, a flaw. Uh, and it has to do with if, if you know, if, uh, if I'd rather, I'd, if I had, I'd rather go on a $20,000 trip watching whales and I would do it if they, my family wants to even if I only had 50,000 you know and you got to pay your bills with it but I don't regret the money I've spent I, I, I've wasted some money I've wasted a lot of money but I don't regret any of it because it's I mean I've never I, I thank goodness I didn't have a credit card when I started fishing and I didn't I didn't I didn't keep accounting I didn't see, well, did I lose this year money or did I make money? My my bill collectors would tell me that, you know, so uh, I didn't need to do it. But uh, it's, uh, no, it's, uh, when I was perceived by what I would say society as being a failure, my third year before I won the Classic, by all account counting of society, I was a failure. And uh, lost a house, didn't have any money. Uh, and strangest thing, and I'd always lied to myself that I'd go back to Exxon. And, and I was working for the second largest computing center in the world, a booming new industry. I'd go back and just start doing that. But even then, being totally broke, I knew I was never going back. And the strangest thing, being I was at a point where I was would have been if I had gotten a report called for, for success or failure, it would have been F. I liked myself more than I ever had. And that just blew me away. Totally blew me away. So as long as, and I, my parents were survivors. I watched them go through bankruptcy. And I sit on the phone with my mom when she had cancer, talking to bill collectors for hours because I didn't want her to have to talk to them. And, uh, but the one thing I loved about my dad and mom, they never gave up. They never quit working and they would, didn't matter what it was. You know, it was putting food, water, shelter, fire. That's all we knew 
you know, and I don't remember a day I didn't have food. I don't remember a day I didn't have shelter. And so that's all that matters to me. If it, no matter what happens, I've been through the oil embargo. I've been through the financial crisis, and now we're going through something else again. No, nope, I, uh, if I can provide food, water, fire, and shelter, that's all I need to do. Do you think watching your mom go through that early in life, do, do you think that changed the way you thought as a person? I mean, because ultimately at the end of your life, wealth is the last thing that anybody cares about. No, absolutely. And, you know, as a young, I was in my twenties when she died and then watch her turn into who she was down to a skeleton before she died in, in intense pain that they couldn't, no amount of morphine could make go away. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was something that, you know, I, I'll never forget. And, uh, and, but then the main thing I'll never forget was that she was the best person I ever knew. And it can happen to anybody. And then you know, sometimes I don't care who you are or what you are, there's nothing you can do about it. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta go on. And you got to try to go on at a at a at a level. You know, you can't have a you can't be Rick Clun when he doesn't catch a fish at a tournament and has his pity party. You can't, life doesn't tolerate pity parties. My 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 oldest daughter's favorite term is you got to put on your big girl your big boy pants and move on, or your big or your big girl panties and move on. So, uh, no, it's that's part of life that you know that all 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 humanity has shares at times and there's and and we look what's going on on the other side of the planet right now and yet we're still here chasing little green fish you know, you know where else could i do that you know so yeah I, I have what i perceive as negative things in life but go on move on you know we still have, have like, we still live in a great world over here very very blessed and very lucky what uh i mean it's funny you say that because i say that all the time i'm like you know when things get stressed or people get stressed about silly things at work i'm like you realize we're we're about to decide who has the five biggest bass today i mean it's that <laughs> in, like when you really just simplify it like they, there's people uh, who have jobs that are changing people's lives but we're gonna decide who got the five biggest <laughs> bass today oh yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. no it's it's, you know, and it gets back to my oldest child, Sage. His mind is way beyond most humans' minds. And I don't mean in in textbook way. Yes, he that too, but just this way of looking at the world. And, and, the, and the truth is, it's kind of like we had a beautiful sunset yesterday, yesterday afternoon. And I looked at it and River looked at it and he said, and then Melissa looked at it. But no two of us are seeing the same sunset. When you blink your eye, you're not even seeing the same sunset. You're seeing a, a new one. And it's the old deal we used to do, I remember in school or someplace or, or, or parties where you'd whisper something, somebody's here, and they'd whisper it, and the next person it goes around. By the time it gets around, it's totally a different interpretation. So you got to understand that about humans is that we... No matter how often you think we're seeing the world the same way, we're not. And, uh, but, and so that means we're all different and we have to, what it also means is we, we've got to be understanding of those other people. And I still will never forget fishermen, President Bush, uh, senior. And the day we fished together, I kept apologizing. And I've, I've told you this story before about calling him George. He kept going like, George, that, that's a good one. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President. And after about the third time I did that, he he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Rick, he said, today you're not a world championship fisherman. And I'm not the president of the United States. We just are two guys who love to fish. And that's what I keep trying to remind myself, no matter who I'm around. And and they, they may be spurting, you know, spurting off some type of politics that I don't necessarily agree with. And but you know, but we're in a boat. So let's don't let's just appreciate the parts of the life that we we do love and share 
you know, because we're not going to agree on everything, never will. I don't think it's normal to expect to agree on everything. You, you know, I think that's one of the most messed yeah. up things nowadays where people are like, I mean, you brought up politics, but people want to have a political person that aligns with their beliefs in every section. I, uh, some of my best friends in the world, like some of the people who I cherish the time that I get spent with most, I don't agree with everything they think either. That's that's why you have a mind. Oh, no, no. No, absolutely. And uh, it's just... I guess it's uh, so. What's the lesson there? And the lesson is just we got to be more tolerant and understanding, and uh, and realize that even the people you most love in life, y'all don't agree on everything, and even close most of the time. Um, so, yeah, I just think folk, try to focus on the things that we share, and uh, you know, and the, that's that's the good thing about we're just going to weigh in five fish today, and that's important because a lot of the people there are sharing the same thing, sharing the same thoughts and the same love for the outdoors and, and fishing. You talked about looking at that sunset with your family. Do you remember how old you were when you started noticing sunsets and sunrises as being something special? Hmm. That's a good question. I never really thought about it. Hmm. I don't know if I can answer that. I don't, uh, I, I, I may be another good thing about growing old. You start to appreciate things, uh, that you didn't before. Uh, that, and then, and of course, you know, when I met Melissa, at first, I'm going to be honest with you, her beauty blinded me. Okay. You know the sun can blind you, and you know the snow can blind you. But I didn't realize that beauty could blind you. And uh, But she wouldn't allow me just to see that, and she forced me. And and when she when I finally started looking beyond that, my world got twice as big because I started seeing the world through her eyes, not just mine. And sunsets was one of those. I never forget the first time I was in the boat and we were fishing on Lake of the Ozarks. I was going down this bank, and she all of a sudden said, that's a monarch butterfly. I would have never seen it. And then, and then we walk through the woods, and that's a certain type of mushroom. I would have never seen it. I look at, so I see a world, and she sees a world. And we finally, we, I mean, we got into where we share it. So my world's gotten bigger. Well, that's true with everybody around you, is that, you know, we're looking through a certain lens, a certain window at the world. And if we allow, to, if, we, if other people allow us to look through theirs, the world gets a lot bigger. So yes, that's probably, I see more sunsets now because of other people around me. And I know I've saw before then, we were on the water so much that you see the sun rise and you see it set more than probably most humans do being a fisherman. I can't say when the first one time was though. I, I think I think you're. I, I the only reason I asked that is because I I find and I I don't know when I first started noticing them, but I do remember when. I I for whatever reason I started making a big deal. You know what I mean? Like I in our house, like whenever we can, I watch that exact moment when the sun just disappears. Like that, there's a, like a split second in time where you can still see the sun and then doop, it goes over a ridge or a tree, whatever you're, however you're viewing it. Um, but I remember Maybe. a buddy of mine who played professional hockey started making fun of me. He's like, oh, the sunset, the sunset. And he's now retired. <laughs> and a few years later, he posted a picture of a sunset. And I said, oh, the sunsets matter to you now. And it is. I think as you're younger, you're just like, well, that's what happens. Do you do you ever get to see Northern Lights down that far in Canada? I, I uh, we that's, that's, we have very few here, but I've been to the Arctic and seen them oh, yeah. in all of their glory, okay. and and it's like it's not even real. Like it looks like it, yeah. it looks <laughs> like somebody made you eat a special mushroom and you just laid down and the world started <laughs> turned into a kaleidoscope because it is yeah. it. It's one of the few things I've seen in life that I don't think pictures did it justice. No. And that's, and you mentioned earlier bucket list. That is one that I didn't think about this on my bucket list. I would love to see the Northern Lights. We're actually 
hopefully going to Alaska next summer. I don't know if you can see them in the summer, though, up there. Can you? Or do you know? Tail end of the summer. Tail end of the summer. That's when I okay. saw them um, in the Arctic. I mean, it's kind of the tail end of the summer where you just have, I mean, the winter is the best. But um, yeah. tail end of the summer, you, where you just have a few hours of of darkness, okay. really, and uh, it it is one of the most miraculous things. It, and like I said, most things, pictures, cameras today take. I mean, you shoot stuff, and it looks so. It, there's things it makes look better, but it was it's just so vast. I find that about the Arctic in general, like the when you get places like that, it, you can't show the vastness of it. No. No, I, even sunsets, I don't, it's so hard to do them justice. Because, like I said, you can have the fastest camera on earth and click it a hundred times during that sunset, and you're still not taking the same sunset picture. And that's what blows you away, is that you think you're looking at the same one, but it's constantly changing. You know? and that's the, but that's kind of neat to know, because you know how... I do. You did everybody. You look at it and then you look away. Then you look back at it. Ooh. Then you look away and you look back. Ooh. It's because it's changing so fast. So it's like life, but we don't spend a lot of time. You know what I mean? When you think about it, like you look at it, you look away, and it's it's all changing every single time. But we get busy. Tell me, tell, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. It's would you change anything about your 50-year career? If you believe in the science, and I always find this amusing, that even when a person walks out in the street, and this is a sad transition from that, and, and talks to a person at the doorway, and then somebody else says something to them, and then they step across the street and they're run over by a car. They go, would you change anything? What one thing he did that morning would have changed that, and that can get that can he could have also that guy that talked to him could have stopped him just long enough that he went across the creek he didn't get run over the street. So when you would you when you ask me if I would change anything in my fifty years I might be afraid to, and and the fact that I can't immediately think of something, even what most people perceive as the bad and the good. No, I, I, I probably wouldn't. Um, the uh, I yeah okay. Now I'm going to get selfish here. I wouldn't have jumped that dang tanker wake on the St. Lawrence River, you know, <laughs> and broke my back. You know, <laughs> crushed three vertebrae. Yeah, I would change that. I, I have to admit, I yep, I was but you know, it's just and you've seen those those big tankers coming up, going against the current, and the wave is way over there, and it takes forever to get to you. Didn't see it. Yep. There, I guess I would change that. I, 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 and I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but I, I've talked about it, I know, in this podcast, but I read a thing after 9 11, and it really has kept me sane in life. And it was this just, you know, we, we all read re tons of different things. Some of it affects you, some of it doesn't, but it was you are where you're meant to be. And it tells a story about this guy who's rushing out to work and, as he goes out to work, his kid hands him something and it knocks his coffee out of his hand and his coffee falls all over his shirt. And he has to go change because he's got a big meeting with whoever that day. So that time that he spent changing, he missed the train and he showed up late for work. At the same time, there was somebody who had a bunch of different things happen and they showed up late for work. But ultimately, it builds all, all these different people who showed up late for work. Well, they worked in the twin towers and the fact that these negative things happened is why they're still here today. And ultimately the tagline is you are where you're meant to be. So throughout my entire life, after reading that, like being stuck in airports and being different places that you, you, you don't want to be at that time, just that whole mantra of you are where you're meant to be kind of has kept me sane. But uh, do you believe in that you are where you're meant to be? Yes and no. I uh, again, I have a you, you you figured it out a long time ago, like a lot of people do. I do look at the world and my world of fishing in a strange way. 
But uh, I read a book wrote by Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Lee to Seagull several years ago. And uh, he wrote another book, and it basically said that, you know, your life is this thing of, of a road you're going down. And when you hit a situation that may determine dramatically your life, it forks. And you actually, you say, well, those guys took the, took the left fork, and if they'd stayed on the right fork, they would have been in the tower. But his theory was, no, part of you, you take both forks. In other words, you have parallel lives, and this is really, you know, stretching it. But uh, I've had situations in life where I believe that actually happened to me. And ironically, after I hurt my back at the St. Lawrence River, we, our next tournament was in Champlain, and I didn't know how what the severity of my back was, and I went on to Lake Champlain. And the first day of practice, I uh, I started throwing up on the water, and I had to come off the water but due to the pain. And and I went into town, and uh, they told me where you could, this pharmacy I could find that would have what I was looking for. And as I'm driving through Plattsburgh, New York, I'm looking, I know I'm getting close and I'm looking down, and I'm driving an unfamiliar road. I'm looking down the street because I know it's about a block or two down on the left and I run into the light. I didn't see the light. And all of a sudden in my peripheral vision, I see a car and I hit the brake as hard as I could. And I swear, I thought I had to hit that car. There's no way I wasn't going to hit that car. And yet I never felt the impact. And then I never. And part of me knows I hit the car. And I know I'm going crazy here because I was in pain <laughs> from the back and all of that. But to this day, I don't know how I missed that car. I don't know. Because, I mean, I, I, my nose was on him and he hadn't, hadn't, hadn't cleared the, the, the intersection yet. So, is that true? I don't know. I, how much, you know, other questions, how much control do you have over I am where I'm supposed to be? Uh, if you're, a, you know, a very spiritual person, you will give control to other, other, other things, other, you know, uh, sacred things. But uh, I don't know. You know, you, you can, you know, that, that was a positive thing for, the, for those two, but there were several others probably that weren't supposed to be there or some reason got a call and were there. You hate to think that they were where they were supposed to be. So it's got both a, a negative and a positive side to it. So I just really not think about it. <laughs> it's that's that deep thought that you get into that you know you won't be able to answer. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think you were supposed to be Rick Clun, who you are obviously you were named Rick Clun. But what I'm saying is, do you believe the person that you are, the figure that you are in this sport? Do you believe you were born to be that? I believe it, I was born for that to be a possibility, but there were just many things that determined whether I chose that road or not. Uh, and I can look back on a lot of the things that made my mind up about doing it. Uh, because I had the best job on the planet. I was in the second largest computing center in the world. I had retirement. I had all the insurance you'd ever want. I had, you know, I was moving, I, I was moving from operations to operating all these big IBM computers to the whole 10th floor of the, of the to they moved me to programming to to program the, the payroll for all their tankers in the ocean. And uh you know, the, the, all the people that worked on Exxon owned all the tall oil tankers and stuff. Uh, so why leave that? Uh, but something in me, at the same time I did with, with my father-in-law, who was a great golfer, he worked for NASA until he stuck his hand under a G-force machine with an instrument to test for G-force and it crushed his hand and he couldn't golf anymore. So I, I sit with him on weekends watching Nicholas and all these great golfers, and I never sit with him one time that he didn't say, I could have done that. He says, I could have done that. I was that good. And then I started, because by BASS, I just witnessed um, Bobby Murray winning the Bassmaster Classic at Lake Mead. 
And I just said, wow. And I love to fish. My dad took me all the time and I love to fish. And, uh, and I joined the bass club and immediately started the third year in the bass club. I won the angler of the year in the bass club. And I, Texas had the first major bass tournament of anywhere way beyond Ray Scott. The biggest tournament in, in, in the whole country was the, the Texas state tournament put on by Earl Golding from the Waco Tribune Herald. It would, it would attract thousands of anglers and all they gave away was trophies. And Ray saw that. And that's when Ray kind of, I know, got fired up about way a minute. But anyway, I ended up being second in the individual. They had all kinds of divisions for husband, wife, father, son, team, individual. And I pitched the individual and ended up second out in the whole state. So I'm sitting there watching him say that. I'm working for a great company. And yet this desire in me that I wanted to try to do what Bobby Murray had done. And, and that's really what finally gave me him saying I could have done that. I didn't want to get to that stage in life and say, I wish I would have tried that. So it's uh, was I meant to be that? I had the opportunities not to be. Uh, I had the opportunities to quit my third year when I was completely broke and didn't because of my father. And, you know, like I said, they were broke, but they never quit. They always, you know, keep, keep trying to get, you know, to, so, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's an impossible question. I, uh, I'm, I'm too philosophical, too. You know, I've studied everything from reincarnation to Bhagavad Gita to the Holy Quran to the Bible to the, the, all these great books. And there's, all, there's great truths in all of them. Uh, Buddhism, Zen. Uh, I've made the mistake of doing what I'm doing right now and telling you about that. Because, you, you know, I've, I've been, you know, I've had a lot of feed, uh, negative feedback from making statements about sin. When I won my classic in 1990, I probably told you this, but I quoted John Tennyson Siegel <laughs> and and, uh, and then uh, the Zen and the Art of Archery. And uh, anyway, uh, after it was over, anyway, I eventually I had a group in, to come back on me hard on that. Uh, another spiritual group and uh but but, but that night though, i'll never forget we the after the after the, after the banquet we used to have a banquet to celebrate your win and roland got in, in the elevator with me and he says seagull he says the only thing a seagull's ever done is crap on my shoulder <laughs> you know and i said that ought to tell you something roland. <laughs> you know? but anyway so yeah, you get into those subject matter there's no real answers. Not not that you know, I don't know. But but is the answer to those I mean, and this sounds super I mean, there's some people checking out right now during this conversation, but I don't care because I think it's the coolest conversation ever. But is the is there do they have an answer or is the answer the knowledge you gain as You've always had, it seems to me, your entire life, you've had a thirst to learn, to explore. Um, so is there actually an answer? Or is the answer the, the journey or the quest? Yeah, absolutely. You're, that's my conclusion. It's, it's a search. It's uh, never quit searching. Uh, because I don't know that we'll ever have a complete answer. Some people will tell you, yeah, there is a complete answer. I haven't found it. And, uh, but I enjoy, I, I do enjoy the search and it gets back to what I said about happiness. Are we guaranteed happiness? Are we guaranteed answers? Maybe not. We're guaranteed the pursuit of them. And, and that's what makes life worthwhile. Uh, it's, uh, Joseph Campbell said, uh, there is no meaning to life. He says, you're the meaning. Within you is the meaning to life. And it's foolish to search outside of yourself for meaning when it's inside you. He says, what you bring to life is what gives it meaning. Life itself has no meaning. So that's just another opinion. Very cool stuff. I don't even know if I want to ask this question, and I don't even know if you want to answer this question. Is this your final year? Will you retire after this year or? 
I don't, I'll be honest with you, my most honest answer there is I don't know. Uh, it's, because uh, I have value. I have evaluated it the last several years. Uh, you know, I did win an event in 2019. That was my last event that I won. Uh, since then, like I said, in my early career, I didn't do any accounting. But now, but at the same time, I've been doing it for 50 years. And, and I, you know, I really, the last year or two, I've been thinking there was only maybe four, maybe five of those 50 years that I didn't make money fishing terms. I'm not talking about sponsoring. I'm just talking about entry fees, expenses and entry fees. And then you, you did well enough in terms that you actually ended up in, in making money. And there's only four of those years that I did not make money. And so, but the four, the, the five and five, I said, but four of the, but three of those years have been my last three. And we're paying, you know, we're putting close to 75,000 counting entry fees and expenses into, and you're investing into that year. So, yeah, there's that economic financial question you always have to ask yourself do you want to keep spending $75,000 a year and losing money? Uh, so yeah, that question's there. Uh, the the early quit answers to that was when I quit loving it, and I haven't stopped loving it. I still love the proposal. It still gives me, and COVID taught me that, it still gives me the thing that will challenge me mentally and physically more than anything else, and that's what keeps me, that's what makes me alive. Uh, so, you know, and I still love it. So I've got the financial part now going and just still the love part of it. And, but the other one now is, and I always to fully face, gosh, this is an opportunity to learn. Even if you get, I hate losing like most competitors do, but it's not as bad if you're learning. And these kids are teaching me a lot and giving me the opportunity to learn something I've never done before. And uh, can I, do I have time? I don't know. So I really don't know. Some of those questions are yet unanswered. To be honest, I think that was the answer I hoped you'd give me. You know what I mean? Like, I get it as a podcast host. I'm sure for you to say, yeah, this will be my last year. I'm going to retire on this date. I mean, that that's what makes a successful podcast. But as a fan, as a friend, as a person who loves this sport and everything you've brought to it. I don't want to hear that. I, I want to hear that, you, you know, I, I want you, you to make the decision when you're ready to make that decision. And I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, but I, I'm happy with your answer. I think. Um, well, to, to end that, one of my favorite things you said, which when I won in 2016, you know, all the old crew who went to MLF and in 2016, and you go, you wonder what you were talking about earlier. Some things are meant to be. And I even told Steve Bowman before that tournament, the perfect person to win this tournament is me. Okay. Before the tournament started. And he said, why? And I said, because all those old guys can't say that if we'd been there, we we would have. Yeah. I know it was 2000, the 2019 tournament. But so all the old guys would say, if we'd been there, those guys wouldn't have won it. Because but I had beat them, those same guys in 2016. All the old guys were there. And so when I went in 2019, they can't say, well, if we've been there, we would have beat that one. They hadn't beat me the year before, or 2016. And so, but one of my favorite things was you even made the statement on stage, we didn't understand why you didn't retire. That would have been a perfect time to retire in 2016. And now we know why you didn't in the 2019. So I will, I will remember that statement because that was uh, uh, a very meaningful one at that point in time. Wow. I, I have thought that for, I, I I didn't remember saying that, but I, I mean, obviously I did, but it's funny. Cause I've said that for many, like if 16 didn't happen, 19 has a whole different narrative, you know, it, it's so yeah, no things, things, I mean, in that situation, I think things happen for a reason. And um, um, well, it makes life interesting when, when 
there seems to be some, what do you call it? Uh, I can't even think of the term. Uh, when somebody beats somebody and it was morally justified, you know, and, and it was, there's a, you know, I don't know, I can't think of the terminology. Rick, I, I told you, I, I don't, I mean, I try to just have a conversation in these, these shows and, um, but I did put a little research into you and, and one thing that, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to blow up the whole thing. I mean, people look at you as this Zen master, Chuck Norris, Mr. Miyagi, whatever you want to refer to you as a, a, many of those, but is it true that you have the world's most ridiculous sweet tooth? I don't know uh, who's measuring that. Um, I have a feeling I do know one source. Uh, yes, I do. I chocolate is. I just I love and dark chocolate. Uh, but science has now supported me on that part, so I don't feel because science says now if you stay in the sun a lot, one of the best things you can eat for your skin is dark chocolate. Now, there's all kinds of dark chocolate, so I'm not absolutely sure which kind I'm talking about, but it's really good for sunburnt skin. So I have to keep eating it. Yeah, I, keep, I love haagen ice cream, uh, dark chocolate, candy. Um, of course, you know, and there's some, some things I'm not even going to mention because I can't, I can't even lie about the health quality to them. I don't know. <laughs> you know there's no part of health quality to them except your own pleasure. I, I find it good. It's one of the most humanistic qualities I've ever found about you, Rick. You know, you you uh, um, beside a knucklehead like me, I start to feel like, wow, I'm not half the human Rick Clun is. But the thought of you just hammering through a tub of Hagen Doss makes me feel good about life. I don't know why, but it just does. Well, I can't. I didn't hear anything else you said after you said you're not half the human because I don't like that. So please don't say that. No, no, no. What what I said. Uh, uh, hopefully, you got me again. You but said, I said I'm not. I'm not half the human. You are, Rick. I don't know. You. That's not true. I just said that I think the thought of you hammering through a pint of Hagen Doss <laughs> makes me feel good about you. That's all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh. I, I thank you so much for doing this. And, and you know, the, the only frustrating thing I have every time we do a show, I literally leave that show wanting to do another one with you because you are, you have a marvelous mind. Um, and I appreciate you sharing some of the stuff you've shared with us here today. And, um, but before we're done, we do have this tradition where it's answer a question, ask a question. So we ask our current guest, to ask a question to a guest that they have no idea who the guest is. Our last guest was Tommy Sanders. So his question, not knowing he was asking you, is what superpower did you want when you were 12 years old? And what superpower do you want today? Tommy, yes, sir. Yeah. Tommy Sanders. He, he, Tommy is the epitome. You see so many announcers on TV now and in other uh, with sports and Tommy, too many announcers have have too big an ego, and they start going, "Well, yeah, I played ten years ago and on this, on this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did, I know so so." It's more about their ego, but Tommy never does that. It was never about Tommy. Tommy is absolutely about what he is is observing, and he's so good at it. So, but his question. Um, what superpowers? Um, uh, I don't know. When I was young, I, I'm thinking of the, of the normal ones back then. Who were the superheroes? And the only one I can think of was the Superman. You know, and you know, and it's uh, Clark Kent and Superman and Lois Lane, and it was probably twelve. That was probably. Probably the only one I would even have been aware that somebody was having superpowers. Uh, nowadays, they're everywhere, you know, in, in television and books and things. Uh, and I believe humans have superpowers. I think we're always talking about magic. And I believe there is real magic. And in fact, it's happening around us constantly, but we, we've lost the ability to see it. Uh, 
we need to regain the ability to see it and no place greater than nature itself the sunset you were talking about earlier uh, you know but uh now the superpower i'm probably going to get a little corny here uh, it's i would like to have the power of a drone to be able to elevate how you know how nowadays you get that view of a drone of, of, you, you can fly this valley i live in but you can go fly over a lake uh you know you can see i used to do that me and gary klein started you know before the day before practice started we ran a, a little a high wing plane and fly the lake because it it taught you so much so fast and uh, and then they eventually made a rule you couldn't do that so and I'm sure there's rules out there now you can't fly the lake with a drone either because I know yeah. some of our guys have have drones but that's that's such a neat view of the world it's kind of like I said earlier about having another window of what the world looks like it would be having that, that ability I actually. No, I ain't going. I'm not going to go there. I could do that one time in my life, but I'm not going to go there. That's another mental journey. Just, what? just a teaser. Every time you say I'm not going to go there, every part of my body says, "Please, please go there." No, there. I, I think. Uh, I remember the first time I ever heard of it. Shirley MacLaine came on Johnny Carson. Uh -huh. That's probably you probably don't remember either one of those people, but uh, he had the Tonight Show, and she explained how she could mentally leave her body, okay, and uh, and travel like a drone over the landscapes and stuff. And so I spent several years practicing mentally and physically and doing that because I I did some really very advanced mental stuff in my early career. I, I was studying, you know, the, Alan the first, the Germans uh, were some of the first in the Olympics to use that kind of uh, stuff, visualization. You even see them now when they're going to go down through a ski range, that they can be up top and they're just, they're going through every curve and they're just imagining it in their mind. We're not only imagining it with our mind, they're leaving their, their body like a drone and going down through there and seeing each turn in the slope, you know, in each deal. And so I got to where I could achieve that to a certain level. Uh, but uh, anyway, so there you go, Mr. Sanders. <laughs> that is a great answer. Um, before we leave, I'm going to have to get you to ask a question to our next guest, but how do you train to do that? Or are we not learning any more today? You don't have to take mushrooms. I will tell you that. Okay. Does it help? <laughs> no, it, 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 I don't know, because I really didn't ever use any of those things that Ron Dodge and Timothy Leary and you know, LSD and marijuana. And I, I missed all that. And I'm kind of glad I did, because I learned to do it the natural way. And the natural way is much more rewarding than, than taking a shortcut. You can do it taking a shortcut, but you, but it ends up being placebo and, and not nocebo. So, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. It was just a lot of mental practice, you know, a lot of meditation, a lot of focusing on. And again, the mind is capable of things beyond what we understand as normal people. And you lose it if you don't keep practicing it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you more about this in the future, just so you know. I mean, we, we need to dig okay. a little deeper. But I got to get a question from you from our next guest. You don't know who our next guest is, but just any random question about fishing, about life, about anything. Are you happy? It's a great question. That is a great question. Are Do you happy? You, I would like to. I would like to hear his answer because it's a tough one. The first time I was ever, ever asked that to go. And it was by my son. I go, and then I I remember what I said earlier about the pursuit of happiness. And then it, it gives more meaning. But don't tell him that that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness part until he answers. Okay. I will not. I will not. That's a great question. Rick Clun.
you are a gift to our sport. You're a gift to humanity. And um, every moment we spend together is is a personal gift of mine. So I, I thank you for taking this time and, and doing this show. And uh, most people don't know this, but you're actually doing this on New Year's Eve. So um, thank you very much for taking time away from your oh, family absolutely. today to do this. Well, you're, you're a good person to spend time with on New Year's Eve. Well, th thank you. Do, you. do you do New Year's resolutions or anything like that? What do you do on New Year's? What is Rick Clunn's New Year's Eve like? I really don't because that's lazy. You need to do those. If you're really into that, you need to do them at least once a week on <laughs> your yeah. whole life. So, because we got to keep, you know, you know how those uh, you normally turn out. But uh, if I had to, uh, say something so you can also force to I would say you know allow me to have a pure mind and a pure heart and keep working on that part great words from a great man and uh I thank you very much looking forward to seeing you sir how about that Rick Clun thank you not just for being a guest but thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do for this sport. Wow, what a way to start the season. And uh, here's the good news. <laughs> it keeps coming. Next week's guest, another legit banger. Like, I know people throw out the word banger, but this is a pom -pom, double gun banger. I don't even know what that means, but... If you guys want to find out what it means, you'll have to tune into next week's show. But until then, enjoy being, have a great week, and as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?